Thank you for joining us, Sonny. Sonny previously received the Biophysical Society Founders Award. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine, he received numerous other prestigious honors. He and his research group have made major contributions to single molecule enzymology, single cell whole genome sequencing, as well as pioneering Raman microscopies. Recently, he was named the director of the Beijing Advanced Innovation Center for Genomics. He's made significant advances in single cell genomics in that position. His inventions have been used for pre-implantation genetic testing and in vitro fertilization. His talk is from single molecule biophysics to single cell genomics when stochasticity meets precision. Please welcome Sunny Ji. Well, thank you, David, for the very kind introduction and giving me the distinct honor. I regret that I couldn't make it to San Diego because of the coronavirus outbreak. I have been really looking forward to coming back to this beautiful city where I went to graduate school 35 years ago. Here I was a young man in the laboratory of Professor John Simon working on ultrafast spectroscopy. But in yet naive as I was then, I wondered how biophysics would one day help the world. I hope by the end of my talk, you may have some answers. After a brief postdoctoral experience at University of Chicago, I started my independent career at Pacific Northwest National Lab. It was a very exciting time at which single molecule imaging at room temperature was contemplated. Working with Bob Dunn, my first postdoc, we had our first paper in Science Magazine reporting the probing of single molecule dynamics. In 1998, Peter Liu and I reported the first real-time observation of enzymatic turnovers of a single enzyme molecule by fluorescent measurement. The enzyme is fluorescent in its oxidized form, but not in the reduced form. As the catalytic cycles take place, the fluorescent is turned on and off, reviewing the stochastic biochemical reactions of a single enzyme molecule in real time. We learn a great deal by analyzing the stochastic time traces. For example, an enzyme like us works hard for a while, then slows down, never at a constant activity. Nevertheless, the michaelis menten equation the fundamental equation of biochemistry still holds at the single molecule level. The experiment was different from conventional chemical kinetics in that it is under non-equilibrium steady state condition. In this dashed circle, the enzyme cycles back and forth, no change at the end, nor does the substrate and product concentration. It's buffered, it's constant hence the steady state. Yet, it is non-equilibrium because the substrates are continuously being converted to products because of the constant free energy supply. 20 years later, we're still learning from this experiment, taking ATP hydrolysis reaction as an example. The enzyme cycles through the zero, one, two, three states. The driving force of this reaction is the chemical potential. It is dependent on the log concentration ATP versus ATP ratio. It is linked to the forward and backward flux of this enzymatic cycle. I want to credit Terry Hill who derived this equation well before we did our experiment. Here are the stochastic simulations done by my longtime collaborator Hong Qian. When the driving force is zero, that is at equilibrium, the reaction goes, uh, has no preferred direction, uh, this blue curve like this. If you take a power spectrum of this noisy curve, you get a zero peak at zero frequency. However, at high driving force, the reaction cycles like a clock up and down, up and down, and then the power spectrum shows a resonance with the frequency being 1 over the turnover time. 
So this is to say that the enzyme dynamics is not only stochastic, but also oscillatory, especially at a high driving force. Non-equilibrium steady state resembles the condition in a life cell where oscillatory behaviors are often observed. I'll come back to this point. This 1998 paper arguably earned me a full professorship at Harvard Chemistry Department 20 years ago. These are the two men who recruited me. Jim Anderson, the chair at the time, and Charles Lieber, the current chair. Despite of his misfortune, I'm happy that Charlie got elected as member of the National Academy of Engineering two weeks ago. The Academy was not afraid to express a different opinion from the government. I told my kids that a great country should not have just one voice, and that's what made America so great. When I first arrived at Harvard, I had a hunch that the single molecule approach would have important applications in molecular biology. I realized gene expression is a single molecule problem because DNA is the genetic material that passes from one generation to another generation in a cell exists as single molecules. That being the case, fundamental processes such as transcription and translation must occur stochastically, just like the single enzyme trees. Our first paper in molecular biology was published simultaneously in Science and Nature. We were able to monitor protein production one molecule at a time in a live bacterial cell. Each yellow flash here is due to one protein generated by gene expression. From the overnight movie, we could determine the protein production burst frequency A and burst size B. We proved that the distribution of protein copy number per cell should be a gamma distribution with two adjustable parameters A and B, as just defined. Indeed, fitting this measured curve gives us the same A and B as determined from the overnight movie. In doing so, we were able to provide quantitative description of the central dogma of molecular biology. Similar burst gene expression also occurs in mammalian cells, for which I will come back later. One week after the two publications, I received a phone call from Gates Foundation, inviting me to apply for a grant, as they hope our new technique might be useful in understanding why a small group of tuberculosis causing bacterial cells was showing drug resistance. Tuberculosis was claiming the lives of millions of children in Africa each year. Bill Gates later visited my lab. Though we have yet to solve the problem of drug resistance, the Gates Foundation project made me wonder how our work can benefit society. Single molecule enzymology does have practical values. Single molecule enzymatic assays similar to ours has been used to sequence DNA by PacBio. Starting from 2007, a new generation of DNA sequencers led to rapid decrease of sequencing costs, which has made personalized medicine possible. Perhaps the most famous example of personalized medicine was this. In 2013, Angelina Jolie announced that she underwent a preventative double mastectomy because she was the carrier of defective gene BRCA1, giving her 87% risk of breast cancer and a 50% of chance of ovarian cancer. I happened to be attending a meeting at NIH on that day, discussing with a group of experts on how to help parents with genetic diseases to avoid passing on the abnormal genes to their newborns. At that time, a new technique in my laboratory would make this goal feasible. Because of news in the morning, the panel asked me a lot of questions, both about science and about ethics. What was the technique? If you give me a single human cell, I would report to you almost the entire genome. To do so, 
we need to perform whole genome amplification, that is amplifying the minuscule amount of DNA from a single cell before sequencing. And the application has to be uniform. The first method attempted was PCR with random primers. PCR has single copy sensitivity, but it's uneven because it is an exponential amplification. In 2012, my Harvard group invented a new single cell whole genome amplification method, Malbec, similar to the Vine Malbec, which offers more uniform amplification by virtue of quasi-linear amplification. We only amplify the genomic DNA and do not make copies on copies. PCR was only used after five times of quasi-linear amplification, avoiding the sequence-dependent bias in the first few cycles of PCR. We first used Malbec to sequence the genome of individual sperm cells. A sperm is haploid with only 23 chromosomes. We were able to determine the crossover point of the paternal green and maternal red DNA of each chromosome in a single sperm cell. The difference between the red and green sequences are only one part per thousand, that's the SNP rate. Different sperm cells have a different crossover point, which is why brothers and sisters are different, which is also why single cell measurement are important, needed. The sperm cells came from a professor whose graduate student was more interested than himself in finding out whether he was normal. These two sperm cells have abnormal chromosomes, this one missing chromosome 19, and this one has two copies of chromosome 6. Luckily, the guy was still normal, as there are always 5% losers due to the chromosome segregation errors. This would cause genetic diseases such as reproductive disorder, miscarriage, stillborn, or Down syndromes. This 5% does not change with men's age. However, such chromosome abnormality has higher probability for the female counterpart oversight and increases drastically with women's age, the blue line, leading to the rapid decrease of life birth rate as a function of women's age, the red line. So this is oversight that has undergone homologous recombination, resulting in crossovers in the chromosomes. When oversight is fertilized with a sperm, this is the case of a normal embryo. There are two abnormal situations. The middle one has a wrong chromosome copy number, the problem we just talked about. The right one has monogenic disease with a fatal point mutation, either from the father or mother. These two situations need to be screened out. Malbec is capable of detecting both situations simultaneously with higher precision than previous methods. So this is a embryo in vitro, and there are three ways of testing its implantation suitability. The first one we worked on was a polar body biopsy, drilling a hole with a laser in the cell membrane and the pipette comes in sucking out two polar body cells. They are dispensable in the embryo development. But by sequencing them, we could deduce whether the embryo was viable for implantation. The second way was Trifactum biopsy, currently the most widely used method. So after the cell division, one becomes two to four, and on the fifth day, the blastocyst stage, there are about 200 cells, and we use biopsy to suck out a few cells, a subject for sequencing. Recently, we developed the third way through detection of the cell-free DNA in the span culture. During embryo's rapid growth, there are cells undergoing apoptosis releasing DNA into the culture media. And that is enough DNA for us to characterize the status of the embryo. The method is highly desirable because it is non-invasive. 
there are about 6,000 monogenic diseases with known point mutations whose mutations on genome have already been uh, identified and they would pass to offspring according to Mendel genetics. Shown here are the most common monogenic diseases in southern China. The first case of our clinical trial was a male carrier of hereditary multiple exotosis. The man would get bone tumors every two years, all because of the point mutation of this EXT1 gene, which he inherited from his father and grandfather. And he has 50% of chance passing to his offspring. His wife was unaffected, but was 36 years old with a higher chance of a chromosome abnormality. So among the couple's 18 embryos in this IVF cycle, the blue one had chromosome abnormality. The red one had the undesired EXT1 gene. And the green one had neither. And number four was selected for implantation. On September 19th, 2014, the first Malbec baby was born. She was a perfectly normal girl. When we went to see her, she did not even cry, but giving me smiles. The work was done while I was still at Harvard, shuttling between Boston and Beijing, working with my PKU colleagues, Jie Chiao and Fu Chou Tan. To date, more than 1,000 families with monogenic diseases in China have successfully prevented the passing of genetic disorders to their newborns. This is a good example of precision medicine. I'm delighted that our translational work in China has begun to benefit the entire world, including United States. I wish to acknowledge my collaborator, Professor Catherine Rakowski of Brigham Women Hospital. Here we were having a teleconference while writing the joint paper on the non-invasive pre-implantation genetic testing. The work was carried out last year when the anti-Chinese sentiment was rising. During that time, I couldn't resist writing a commentary article that was published in Cell last August. I am still amused. Some people really believe that scientific espionage is real. In my opinion, the accusation is a complete misjudgment, at least in the biomedical field that I worked in. I use my own experiences to make the point that American ideals such as that of Bill Gates should not be forgotten. Let me now move back to the realm of science. When the Human Genome Project was finished in 2003, Eric Lander summed well. Bought the book, hard to read. We simply did not know the grammar to understand the human functional genome. Even though now we can sequence the genome of a single cell from an individual, the compelling scientific challenge is still decoding the human functional genome. Each cell of an individual has essentially the same genome, yet they carry out completely different functions in different tissues. An important way of characterizing functional genome is single cell transcriptome, which was pioneered by Fu Chou Tan, a colleague that I recruited to Peking University in 2010. This is his data showing the embryo development. The three axes a principal component axis of the express level of several thousand RNAs. Each dot is a single cell. Each cluster represents a cell type. Different points in a cluster have variations. This is due to stochasticity of gene expression, not measurement noise. But clearly, one can distinguish different cell types based on these clusters. So single cell transcriptome has been widely used for cell typing with a machine of this, this size. 10X can prepare thousands of cells for sequencing. Another equally important way to characterize functional genome is a three-dimensional genome structure. 
in 2003, the Human Genome Project gave us the linear genome structure. In 2018, we see the three-dimensional genome in a human diploid cell. We see how the 46 chromosomes, 23 from each parent, each folded and contiguous assembled together in a nucleus. The structure was not determined by QRVM, nor super resolution optical microscopy, but by sequencing a single cell prepared in a wet lab. Chromosome conformation capture, 3C chemistry, was first developed at Harvard by Job Decker, using the restriction enzyme to cut the DNA in a fixed cell and let the sticky ends to hybridize to neighbor the ones. And after the ligation, the artificial linkages between two sequences called contacts are detected, reflecting the proximity of two linked sequences. Peter Frieder and co-worker were the first to do single cell 3C, but the number of contacts was limited. Why single cell? You see, each chromosome is contiguous, it's folded. Each one is surrounded, say, by six of them. In one cell, it's this six, and another cell will be another six. So if you do ensemble measurement of many cells, you wouldn't be able to see interchromosome interaction. You can only see the intrachromosome. In recent years, we have been developing single cell whole genome amplification method with transposes, which randomly inserts transposons, these red sequences, into the genomic DNA. And we use them for priming to amplify the genome. So this gives even amplification and high genome coverage. So with that, we were able to obtain two million contacts and that significantly incre increased the spatial resolution to tens of nanometers, about 20 kilobase. So each dot here is one contact. For example, this dot connecting chromosome 5, a sequence in chromosome 5 and chromosome 7. So that means these two sequences on 5 and 7 are close to each other. So with a map like this, we can have this one-to-one -one correspondence to the 3D genome structure. This method is very similar to MR structure determination. You know the amino acid sequence and you have NOE and you can construct a 3D structure even though MR cannot see atoms like X-ray or electron microscopes. To do that, we must rely on the uh, ability to resolve the two alleles, the paternal and maternal DNA, and we have the resolution to do that. So we can sequence any cells. So here we found T cells, B cells, and monocyte have different structure. So the structure of PSA here is defined by the average CPG density going along the linear genome every 20 kilobase voxel. So that's you know, something like the transcriptome along the genome. Okay. Now, again, each dot here is one cell, and you can see for one cell type, you have this cluster. This is not due to measurement noise. This is due to structural fluctuation. But clearly, you can distinguish different cells based on their different genomic structures. And that makes sense because if a gene is not needed in a particular cell, it's just embedded in the heterochromatin. Okay. Uh, heterochromatin has closely packed histones. And euchromatin has loosely packed histones. That's where transcription takes place. We can also measure the methylated DNA the euchromatin is methylated, and the heterochromatin is not that methylated. So when we overlay these two images, uh, the cross-section movie tells us that the euchromatin is contiguous. It's just one phase, and so is the heterochromatin. So it's not like uh, 
water droplets in oil or oil droplets in water. It is just, as far as we can tell, two phases. Okay. The two phases would have different mobilities for certain proteins. For example, transcription factors should be highly diffusive in the eukromatin phase. So here I want to mention the work of Will Greenleaf of Stanford, who independently thought of using the same enzyme of, of transposes that we use for single cell whole genome amplification for the purpose of measuring open chromatin regions. See, this region is open, then it's not protected. You can see which DNA region is open, okay? And this is our most recent single cell attack. Attack is the acronym that he had. We could do this on single cell with high detectability. And each right dot here is open side, and you can see the open side is uh, mostly 80% of them are in the euchromatin, only 15% in the heterochromatin. Okay, now we have the three-dimensional genome structure. We also have the transcriptome, which one is more important. Structure determines transcription, or transcription determines structure. I would say <laughs> they are equally important, and there is something more important, and that is the transcription factors that act like a key to turn on and off gene expression and program the cell state. Okay, the current methods for finding transcription factor binding sites on genomic DNA is CHIP-SIG. CHIP stands for chromatin immunoprecipitation. That is to use transcription factors antibody to put down DNA for sequencing. This is a histogram for the number of transcription factors that can be put down at one DNA binding site. It can be over 150 transcription factors. This only represents the transient and very weak binding because the region cannot simply hold or bind 150 transcription factors at the same time. There are only 500 transcription factors expressed in a particular human cell. There are 20,000 genes, a few thousand genes being expressed. Therefore, each gene cannot be controlled by one single transcription factor, but a combination of them. Many work in the literature pointed out that the transcription factor in mammalian cells must work in unison. Their colocalization controls gene expression and regulation. Such colocalization leads to specificity. See, if a transcription factor spans eight bases on DNA, it would be long enough to be specific for a bacterial genome of one million bases, but not unique in a human genome of a three billion bases. So, transcription factors in bacteria and mammalian cells operate in fundamentally different ways. In bacteria, the transcription factors work by repression, like lactic repressor, for example, binds for a long time. We measure it to be 30 minutes, 40 minutes, with a KD of a picomolar. Each transcription factor controls the expression of one gene or an operon, a few genes. In contrast, in mammalian cells, transcription factors work by activation because histones, by default, repress the gene expression. We measure residence time, binding time of the mammalian factors, and found they are all very short, a few seconds, with a KD of nanomolar. This is very puzzling in that such a short binding time cannot maintain the state of a cell. We know we have this key chain, a combination of transcription factors, but we know very little about how the transcription factors localization is organized or orchestrated. CHIP works only by pulling one TF at a time. Usually it doesn't work for a combination of them. So how do we determine transcription factor localization in an open DNA region or genome-wide? 
So let me first discuss about kinetic cooperativity. I talk about oscillatory behavior under non-equilibrium steady state condition. It has been observed in many cells, yeast, mammalian cells. The concentration of transcription factor oscillates in mammalian nucleus under non-equilibrium steady state condition. This was data of uh, Mike Weiss group a long time ago. This seems to be a ubiquitous behavior. And you see it goes up and down, almost down to zero. Okay? And if the two transcription factors each oscillates, in order for them to co-localize, they must arrive at the same time. That is synchronized, right? So here I want to show you the covariance plot of the 420 express transcription factors in 700 cells of this cell line. You see the positive pairwise correlation of this uh, group of uh, three or four or five transcription factors. It seems like each of them fluctuate, right? It's stochastic and oscillatory. But there's a mechanism that synchronizes them together and only when they come together, you look at this cycle, it's about half an hour, one hour, right? Only when they come together, they can work together. Okay. Next, let me talk about thermodynamic cooperativity. A few years ago, we reported allosteroids through DNA. Protein A and B specifically bind to DNA on their binding sites, but not touching each other. It turned out that they can either stabilize each other or destabilize each other, depending on the gap between them. And this overall free energy of the entire system oscillate with a period of 10 bases, that's the helical pitch. This is because DNA is neither rigid or completely floppy, okay? but it undergoes conformational changes with the protein at this uh, length scale. Okay? So with this phenomena, the binding affinity can differ by a factor of 10 if I just have one pair of them. But if I have um, three or four or five, you can imagine it would stabilize more. And we need this uh, long binding to maintain a gene expression state for the transcription factor localization group. So recently, we evaluated this uh, enhancesome. That, that was the first DNA transcription factor complex with known crystal structure determined by Tom Maniatis and co-workers. Really just a few of them <laughs> that we know the combination. So if I did thermal titration, so the IRF3, if we have nothing else, it's a weak binding, but if we have everything, then at least here we see an enhancement of a factor of 20. Uh, lower KD, longer binding time. So clearly, this thermodynamic cooperativity is encoded in the genomic DNA, independent of a possible protein-protein interaction. Such thermodynamic stabilization would allow the long binding time needed to maintain a cell state. Okay, so we set out to map out transcription factor co-localization genome-wide. How do we do that? So first we use a tag to determine the open chromatin regions. We're only probing those transcription factors that bind to the open chromatin at this point. And then we use the covariance matrix through MRA, the transcriptome measurement, to you filter out, you see in this red, this open region, there are still many motifs. If you get from the encode, the database, you'll see the binding motifs, but they're just transient, unstable binding, right? So we can filter out and only keep those with uh, large positive correlations. 
the synchronized transcription factors. And then we can do the thermodynamic testing in this bare DNA. Okay, so only this uh, DNA sequence detected by the attack to confirm the cooperative binding affinity through thermodynamic titration. So needless to say that this map would be highly pertinent to gene regulation, programming, and cell differentiation, and developmental biology. And that would play an important role in decoding the human functional genome. Finally, I cannot resist to tell you what I have been doing in the past two weeks, doing our part in fighting against the deadly coronavirus. There's no smoking gun here, but we have been working day and night to race with the outbreak. Here's my team at Peking University. Richard received his PhD from Harvard last June. And he was the only person who came back to Beijing with me. Chen Yang is our sequencing facility manager and Wen Jie is our bioinformaticist. We work very closely with these two medical researchers, first at Peking University, and now as I'm speaking, these two are collecting data in the BL3 lab in the Yuan Hospital. So what we have been trying to do is to search neutralizing antibody against uh, coronavirus. The coronavirus targets ACE2 surface receptors of epithelial cells in respiratory tract. The adapt immune system of recovered patients have memory B cells in the blood, providing neutralizing antibody against the virus. Now, each memory B cell provides only one specific antibody through a unique VDJ combination sequence among 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 sequences, uh, large sequences, possibilities. Now, the conventional method is single cell clonal amplification. You pick one cell and then you grow the cell, each cell becomes a clone, and that takes at least a month and a half, which is a lengthy process at this time. So we instead capitalize on single cell genomics to sequence the transcriptomes and the VDJ profiles of individual memory B cells from recovered patients' blood. In recovered patients, they already have the antibody developed you know, against the virus. So here we have the single cell sequencing of enriched B cell population uh, using the 10X machine. B cells are enriched, the 50% of them are memory B cells. So here's the cell typing. And a small fraction of this are the uh, memory B cells and we sequence the VDJ. This is the uh, variable region. And there's also fixed region. And what we're looking for is this uh, IgG Okay, and compare with recovered patients and normal individuals, we see the enrichment in the recovered patients with the IgG. And then we go to the VDJ region and we see eight cells in one case with the same VDJ recombination, but still has somatic point mutation is also necessary. But at least we see Clones are developed in these uh, recovered patients. So we have identified 70 antibody sequences which are enriched in recovered patients and we're waiting for the production of the recombinant antibodies for testing. To the best of our knowledge, nobody has isolated neutralizing antibodies yet from the recovered patients. So what we are counting on is that the single cell genomics is faster. So what they hope to create in the end is a shot of neutralizing antibodies that could cure the disease or serve as temporary vaccine for doctors or family members. No matter what the outcome is, our effort 
over the last two weeks illustrate single cell genomics is taking a central place in biomedical research. And we biophysicists are in a position to make contributions when life science is becoming such a quantitative science. So let me summarize what I have tried to convey. Single enzyme turnover and gene expression occurring on the single DNA molecule in a live cell are under non-equilibrium steady state condition, not only stochastic, but also oscillatory because of the thermodynamic driving force. Life is full of stochasticity. Malbec baby is an example of single molecule, single cell precision trumps over stochasticity. A human cell state is characterized by its transcriptome and 3D genome structure, but programmed by transcription factors whose combinatorial colocalization are determined by kinetic and thermodynamic cooperativity. Single cell genomics is beginning to make an impact in medicine and Diseases have no borders, neither should research. I wouldn't be able to tell you these stories if I had not worked with very talented students and postdocs. Here's my new group at Peking University. My former students and postdocs listed in the areas of single molecule enzymology, gene expression, and single cell genomics. Many of them were more fortunate than I was as a student, making contributions at an early stage. I also want to thank my collaborators over the years, especially my new colleagues at BioPeak, a technology-driven biomedical research center at Peking University. Thank you, David, for giving me the honor, and thank you all for your attention. I think we just witnessed a miracle of 21st century technology. <laughs> and uh, nobody is more relieved than I am that that actually worked. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Sonny. And uh, I think I will um, say for all of us here, we wish you the best of luck with the coronavirus identification. And if uh, you uh, find something, can you send us some over here just in case? <laughs> so uh, while... Uh, Diseases know no borders. Hopefully, uh, neutralizing antibodies will know no borders either. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, thank you, Sunny, for uh, really you. a fantastic uh, talk. Thank you to all the award winners. Thank you to all of the society members that have helped make this meeting possible. Uh, let me all invite everybody now to our reception and dance over in the Hilton Sapphire Room. And there's also a quiet room on the room below, I think, is the Indigo room if you want uh, not to hear uh, rock and roll music played at full blast. Uh, for those of you who are okay with that, let's go dance. Thank you very much.